بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على عبده ورسوله ومصطفاه نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome to lessons in fiqh the chapter we're studying Mustafa is prayer this is not the chapter the chapter we're studying Mustafa is don't cheat okay Muhammad, the conditions of Salat. Guys, you have to reconnect, refresh the page every time we begin because you have to try and connect things together. So, we're studying the conditions of Salat, hadith number 174. Narrated by Abu Huraira, may Allah be pleased with him. Allah's Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa said, glorification of Allah, meaning saying subhanallah is for men and clapping of hands is for women muslim added during prayer of course the addition of muslim was quite essential because if we did not have this people would have thought that saying subhanallah is only for men so women should not say subhanallah but once he put this addition in salat we know that this is only during salat and the origin of this hadith was that the Prophet ﷺ went once and was delayed for coming to Salat. Because he was delayed, uh, uh, the people called for the Salat and Abu Bakr led the prayer, the first caliph. And when the Prophet came والسلام, the companions of the Prophet started clapping. And they were clapping because they wanted to notify Abu Bakr that the Prophet ﷺ came. <coughs> so Abu Bakr noticed that and he went back and the Prophet prayed ﷺ. Afterwards, the Prophet told them that the clapping is only for women during prayer. Men should not clap. But he gave them something uh, 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 that replaces that, which is saying, SubhanAllah. So if the Imam makes a mistake or you want to notify the Im Imam of something, you may s just say during the Salat, Subhanallah, Subhanallah, Subhanallah. This makes uh, uh, as a form of notification to the Imam. And again, we come back to the issue of uh, uh, segregating men from women. This shows us that there is a difference. Because even, even during Salat, when one would presume and say that shaitan is as far as possible and Satan would not be present during the Salat, nevertheless, the Prophet tells us that women should not speak during the Salat. They should not, uh, 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 their voices should not be heard during the Salat. If they notice that there's something wrong, they, the only thing they are allowed to do is to clap. Uh, the following hadith, Hadith number 175. Narrated by Mutarif bin Abdullah bin Sikhir, may Allah be pleased with him, from his father who said, I saw Allah's Messenger وسلم, when he was engaged in prayer and heard a sound from his chest like the burbling of a pot from reaping. Now, uh, uh, Mutarif ibn Sikhir is telling us how the Prophet or his father Abdullah bin Shakhir is telling us how the Prophet Sallallahu used to have this sound as if the pot is bubbling you know when you have boiling water and the pot is bubbling so there's, there's this strange sound coming out he's telling us that the Prophet Alayhi Salatu Wasalam you the, the companion used to hear this uh, uh, noise or sound coming from his chest and and why do you think that this is happening? Because the Prophet ﷺ was weeping. And <coughs> this is a sign of your prayer being accepted, that you weep in prayer. You should try your best to weep in prayer as a sign of your uh, uh, fearing of Allah Azza wa Jal and of regretting your sins. And if you try to compare our situation with the situation of the Prophet ﷺ and his companions, 
you'll find great differences. For example, the Prophet ﷺ, as we've heard, used to weep while praying. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, also when he used to pray, people would not be able to understand what surah he's reciting because of the amount of weeping and crying he does. Umar ibn Khattab was also like this. Sometimes he might uh, uh, recite one surah of the Quran and fall sick afterwards for a day or two because of the amount of fear in him. Uthman ibn Affan also, may Allah be pleased with him, used to recite the Quran and pray night prayers. It was reported that he once read the whole Quran in one rak'ah. And this is authentic, reported by uh, 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 Uthman, may Allah be pleased with him. Ali ibn Abi Talib and so on and on, on. All the companions used to wake up in the, in, in the night and pray the whole night for Allah Azza wa Jal. And they used to weep. And Allah mentions in the Quran that one of the uh, attributes of the believers that they weep and they fall in prostration weeping for Allah Azza wa Jal. Now, do we have this, Fadi? Not really. Why is that? What do you think we don't have this amount of weeping and fear of Allah Azza wa Jal? Because of the distractions present around and how the Muslims have become uh, today, their hearts are not as pure as the hearts Th of their companions. Th that's exactly the point. Our hearts are not as pure as they used to when uh, on the at the time of the Prophet uh, Any other reason, Abu Malik? Because we're not truthful <coughs> with Allah. We're not sincere and truthful with Allah Azza wa Jal. <coughs> Mustafa? Be yes, because we have basically led astray from away from Islam, mm -hmm. away from the way of uh, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Okay. Do you have any other contributions? Well, it's, it's almost the same thing. The problem is our knowledge is not as much as theirs. And our fear of Allah is not as much as theirs. So the more knowledge you have, the more fear of Allah there should be. And I'll give you an example. Most of us may commit a sin or two. And the reason for committing this sin is that w although we believe in heaven and hell, but our belief to it is not that you know, certain to the extent that it would prevent us from doing bad things and it would encourage us to do good things. I remember once I was visited by uh, a, a student who was traveling the following day to uh, a foreign country, a non-Muslim country, to complete his studies. So he came to my house for advice. So when I was telling this boy, because I knew how the, the, his style of uh, lifestyle, so I told him that when you travel to this non-Muslim country, be aware. Now don't think that because you're out of this country and your father and mother are not watching you and there's no imam of the masjid, no teachers that know you, no one else knows you, that this allows you to do whatever you want. Be careful because Allah Azza wa, Jal, Allah Azza wa Jal is watching. So the guy requested permission to speak. It's not military, but he requested to say what's in, what, what was on his mind. So I told him, look, I told him, okay, go ahead. He said, now imagine that I do exactly what you tell me to. I pray, I fast, I am a committed Muslim, I do not fornicate, I do not drink, I do not gamble, and I don't do all the other sins. Imagine. And then I die. And after death, I'm waiting to go to paradise. Someone comes and says, well, that was April Fool. There's no heaven and there's no hell. So I would have wasted my whole entire life for nothing. So excuse me for saying this, but isn't this the, this the case? <clears throat> I've wasted six years of my life being a good Muslim and then boom, nothing. There's no heaven or hell. It was a big joke. So I told the man, I told this young chap that 
I, I completely agree with you. I'm completely in agreement with you. A lot of people have the same feeling. But let's reverse it. Imagine if you're not a good Muslim and not a committed one. You don't pray, you fornicate, you drink booze, you do pot, you do this, you have all the fun you want in your life. And after 60 years you die thinking that there's no heaven and hell. And wow, they come to you and throw you straight into hell. What would you do then? The guy paused for a second and said, well, I, I didn't think of it this way. I always thought of it the first way. I told him, yes, because Shaitan comes to you. He, always, he o only wants you to think of it the first way. But to think that, okay, if I do uh, uh, bad, I'm going to be punished, he never talks to you about this. And for you to know, Fadi, what are the things that a person should know to realize if he's on the right track or not, you, all what you have to do is look around you. All this perfection we see, all this creation of Allah Azza wa Jal, we have, it points that there is only one God, and that is Allah Azza wa Jal. And if we know that Allah's Azza wa Jal attribution, that is wise, great, powerful, and so on, we know that He would not create us and leave us astray. He has to tell us what to do. You cannot go to the market and buy this gadget, you know, electronic uh, device with all these gauges and buttons and it's a state of the art and accept, expect the manufacturer to s put it on sale without putting a manual, without providing you with a manual. Allah Azza wa would not create these, these perf perfect creations of His without giving us a manual what to do. So Allah Azza wa gave us the manual. He sent to us a person to explain this manual to us. It was the Prophet ﷺ. So we have the Prophet ﷺ explaining the Qur'an. And from there, you can tell that what Allah Azza wa wants us to do is correct and it's authentic and you believe in the oneness of Allah and then you believe that there is heaven and hell. Otherwise, there's no guarantees for you. So you have to go back to the basics and learn why people love Allah Azza wa Jal, why people with knowledge know that the, uh, heaven and hell exist and that is why this calls them to get closer to Allah and that is why is causing them to weep from the fear of Allah. We have a short break so please stay tuned. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and welcome back. Just before the break, we were talking about how the Prophet ﷺ and his companions used to pray and weep and how our hearts are as solid as stones, as hard as stones and we don't weep from the fear of Allah due to the lack of knowledge. We don't know Allah Azza wa Jal and we don't know what He wants from us and we don't have anything that draws, draws us closer to Him except these few things that we do every single day and night and thinking that we are good Muslims while we are not. And to tell you or to show you or to give you an example, if one of us were to be given a blank piece of paper and, would be, uh, and, and, and he would be requested to fill in this paper as many as he can remember the attributes and names of Allah. Do you think that we would pass 30 or 40 names? Lots of people would not pass this. If we were asked to write about the meaning of uh, 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 Allah's mercy, or Allah's, uh, Allah's uh, kindness, Allah, we would fail to do this. There are attributes of Allah, names of Allah, that we do not know the, na the meaning of them. And we just say them. While if we were given a blank piece of paper, and we were told to write the lyrics of one of the famous songs, we would probably need more and more blank papers to write them because we know so many of them. Ibn al-Qayyim, may Allah be pleased with him, wrote a book. It's three volumes. The book is in three volumes, approximately 1,200 pages. 
And the book was called Madarij al-Salikin Fi Manazil Iyaka Na'budu Wa Iyaka Nasta'in So he came to one uh, uh, verse of the Quran Of the Fatiha And he wrote 1200 pages Just contemplating on this verse 1200 pages and, and on one verse only So imagine the, right, Just compare the knowledge they had With the knowledge about Allah Azza wa Jal that we have. One would argue and say, listen, why should I weep? I didn't kill anyone. I don't fornicate. I don't drink, uh, into uh, consume any intoxicants. I don't uh, steal. I don't gamble. I don't bribe. I don't do any of the major sins. Then why should I weep? The same question would be reversed and you would be asked, why did the Prophet ﷺ weep? Why did the companions weep? They did this because they were afraid of Allah. They loved Allah so much, yet they feared Allah so much. And it has to go in parallel. And they looked at the blessings that Allah have put and given them. And they were afraid that they did not thank Allah enough to suffice these blessings of Allah. They looked at their sins, and by talking about sins, we don't necessarily mean major sins, but there are minor sins, and they are, there are recommendable things that they did not do, or not unpreferred things that they have done, makruh, and, and so on and on. Now we should weep more and more than they did, because we have more actual and real sins than they did. And this tells us the difference between them and us. Uh, we move on to the following hadith. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Narrated Ali radiallahu an. I had the permission of Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to see him in his house at two times. And whenever <coughs> I entered to him while he was praying, he would clear his throat is a sign to me. Now this hadith is not authentic. It tells us that if you want to give a signal to someone, you may clear your throat. So <coughs> this is clearing the throat. So uh, in this hadith, it tells us that Ali had two times to permission to enter uh, to the house of the Prophet ﷺ. And whenever the Prophet wanted to allow him to do so while praying, he would clear his throat. But this hadith is not authentic. And that is why we move on to the following hadith. Narrated by Ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma, I asked Bilal radiallahu anhu, how did you observe the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam replying to their salutation? He means the companions. The, how did you observe the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam replying to their salutation while he was engaged in prayer? He, Bilal said, he used to do this way and he, Bilal, demonstrated by spreading his palm. Now this hadith tells us again that if a person is praying, him, he may not answer back when people salute him. When people say, Assalamu Alaikum, he may not say, Wa Alaikum Salam. Because this would be considered as, Fadi? Nullifying his prayer by speaking. By talking. talking. And talking and speaking during prayer is not permissible. So, Ibn Umar, may Allah be pleased with him and with his father, ask Bilal, may Allah be pleased with him, so how did the Prophet do, alayhi wa when people came in and said, Salaamu Alaikum. So Bilal uh, described that by raising his palm. So it's like saying, Wa Alaikum Salaam. So while you're praying, you may do this if somebody says, Assalamu Alaikum. And uh, I think it's worth uh, noting that a lot of Muslims nowadays salute each other by raising the hands or by doing this or by, you know, raising their, uh, their eyebrows or by saying this. Now, these are all forms of uh, 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 salute to or of the Christians and the Jews. And Ibn Qayyim mentioned, may Allah have mercy on him, that it is not permissible for a Muslim to do this, uh, to salute, to make salam using his uh, hand or finger or 
his eyebrows or his nodding the head. This is not permissible. So, uh, uh, yes, no. So, how if we com uh, combine between Assalamu Alaikum and we move like Assalamu Alaikum? For example, like. No, this is also not acceptable to say Assalamu Alaikum and raising your hand unless the person you're saluting is far away and your voice will not reach him. As if, in the case, if a person is about four, four or five uh, hundred meters away from you, and if you say Assalamu Alaikum, he'll not hear you. So you wave to him, say, saying Assalamu Alaikum while waving. So this is okay. But what people do nowadays when they come in a meeting and they introduce, so this is gentleman so and so, and he says, nodding the head itself is not Islamic. And also, uh, uh, nodding the finger by saying this or by saying that or whatever salute, this is un-Islamic. Our Islamic uh, uh, salutation is to say, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. This is the Islamic way of uh, doing it. And it tells us, the hadith also teaches us how uh, Ibn Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, was so keen on learning the sunnah. Every th single thing that the Prophet did, alayhi salam, he wanted to learn and know exactly how he did it, why he did it, so that he would also follow uh, uh, suit. Any, had any remarks? Okay, the following hadith. Narrated by Abu Qatada, may Allah be pleased with him, Allah's Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, was offering prayer while he was carrying Umama, the daughter of Zainab. When he prostrated, he put her down, and when he stood up, he lifted her up. Muslim also added, while he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, led the prayer in the masjid. Okay, now this hadith <coughs> tells us about the movements allowed for a person while he's praying. As you remember that we said that movements, if you move a lot during prayer, this is not acceptable. Al-Imam Abu Hanifa and the followers of the Hanafi school say if you move three movements or more, your prayer is invalid. Is this true, F Fadi? Yes, I think because there was a, a person who moved uh, many times in his prayer and then his prophet, the Prophet told him to repeat three times. Prophet every time he, he moved, he had him repeat three times and then he told him that he was moving. So, how many times do you think the Prophet moved while carrying Zainab? Oh, we're carrying uh, uh, Umama. Mustafa. I'm sure he carry, he moved more than three times while doing this. But with with this opinion, I think uh, many scholars have said that is that it is incorrect and there is no why three, why not four, why okay. not five. Okay, sounds good. Mustafa, you have anything? Because it has to be more than four. Because even if it was two rakahs. He has to have moved it like two times every rakah, so it would be four. So you don't so agree with the opinion that says three movements nullifies the prayer. There is no evidence. It has to, you have to have evidence. This hadith tells you that he used to carry Umama. And he used to carry her during the prayer. And whenever he bowed or prostrate, he put her aside. And then she, he moved and picked her up. And this is a lot of movement. And this was during prayer when he, when he led the prayer, alayhi salatu uh, uh, Umama is the daughter of Zainab. Zainab. Do we call people after their mothers or after their fathers? Fathers. The only time we call, you know, you know, we shouldn't call them after their mothers, but because of Zainab is the daughter of the Prophet ﷺ, she is more important to us than her husband. But does anybody know the husband's name? Any clues? Uthman. Uthman ibn Affan. Is that correct? No. Abdul As ibn Rabi'. Abu As ibn Al Rabi'. He is the companion of the Prophet. She embraced Islam before he did. And she migrated to Medina and he did not. And he was captured on the bat in the Battle of, uh, uh, I think, uh, Badr, if I am not mistaken. And she. Her, his wife, though he, he is not a Muslim and she's a Muslim, uh, uh, took a, a, a necklace that belonged to her mother Khadija and sent it to the Prophet ﷺ as 
uh, 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 his ransom so that he would be freed. And the minute the Prophet saw it, والسلام, he had this feeling, you know, for Khadija. So he asked the people, he told them that Abu al-As is my son-in-law, though he's not Muslim, and my daughter sent this uh, uh, necklace to me. So you make your choice. What do you think? So immediately, without any questioning, they said, let him free, O Prophet of Allah. Yani we don't want Abu al-As. He's your son-in-law and so on. Now, there are lots of things connected to this story as for the marriage contract. Was it void because she's a Muslim and she, he's a non-Muslim or not? We're not going to go into details. So the Prophet ﷺ set him free. The man went back to Me Mecca, gave all the people their belongings and their uh, goods that, and, and the deposits that he had and then went back to Medina and embraced Islam and he went back with his wife Zainab the daughter of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I believe that this is all the time we have for today's program. So until we meet next time, Fi Amanillah, Wassalamu Alaikum Warahmatullahi Wabarakatuh.